Hello guys, today we're going to be dwelling into hash tables and how they work. So the structure of this video says we first are going to be focusing on the theory so we understand how the structure works in a more in a more theoretical way so we can apply it in a more um, programmable way. That means that we're going to first learn the theory of the hash tables and then we're going to apply the actual uh, well implementation. Uh, in C++. Let's go ahead and uh, start. So hash tables, what are they? Um, the most simple explain the most simple way to explain. I forgot to write here. Uh, the simple the most simple way to explain hash tables is to first understand what their primary role is or use. In this case, uh, the most important part is to store data in an associative array. So. In order to understand this, we have to understand how each element works. So in this case, let's say this is our element, right? This, this whole box is our element. And this element will have an index. It is gonna start, it's gonna be stored in a table and it's gonna have an index. Let's put it three. Whenever we want to find a key, well, a value more likely, we're going to call the key. So in a sense, we can see this as, uh, as um, so to speak, dictionary. So that means we get the key, and from the key, we get the value, right? We can also find this, the position of the element by doing so. So this is more of a, a high understanding of this, but we want to see more of, in a more visual way. So how can we do this? Let's go ahead and go in a more visual way to see how this works. So we have our fun hash function f of x. That means that x is gonna be the keys that we're gonna be putting in there. And the key, once we get the hash function and we run it, it's gonna return us a number that's gonna be at the index where we are gonna store the element. And within the element, we have a key and a value. So let's see and give an example here. In this case, we have hash, and this is my name, Sebas, and we're gonna be doing hash of Sebas, and it's gonna return me the number three. This means that we're gonna store whatever uh, element of Sebas into the index three. Same thing for Mike, which is gonna be the same situation here, is gonna return one, and we're gonna put one into, well, we're gonna put our, our element of Mike with key Mike and a certain value into our index one. Same thing with Hime. Right now, uh, we have something called collisions in hash tables. This means whenever two tables have the same index, sorry, two, two, two elements have the same index. So in this case, Sebas and Hime have the same index. And as you can see, you have a collision. There are two ways to um, circumvent this. Uh, the one we're gonna be looking at first is called chaining. So the chaining means, okay, um, as you can see, the slot is already taken. So if the slot is already taken, let's just continue on the slot, but with a, with a linked list. So we get a linked list here, a simple linked list. So just one direction and it's gonna continue, right? Um, it's important to note that using the hash function, it says here, using the hash function uh, is O of one. But if we chain on collisions, then it's O of N. This will be because of the following example. Let's just give an, a really quick example here of why this is so. Oops, let's duplicate this and once more. <clears throat> Imagine I want to, this is another type of um, color and this is another type of color. I'll just put green or something. And let's say we want to add a, a new hash for, I don't know, Peter, right? And this returns three, obviously. And Peter has a following element, which is this. So it, once we get there, we're like, okay, we want to go on three. But three is already taken. So we go to the next slot. Oh, it's already taken. We go to the next slot. Oh, it's already taken. So we try to find the slot where we have no um, no linked no, no, no linked node in our linked list. So that means this guy. So as you can see, we go iteratively throughout the whole list. So that means it's an O of N. So let's remove this, let's remove that. 
So now let's go ahead and understand the functions. So the functions have three. We have three functions when it comes to hash tables, three main functions. Obviously, we can have more functions when it comes to it. But this is generally speaking the functions we have to implement. This insert, which inserts elements, as you can see, it uses the element as the element as, as, as a value when they use a type of uh, data type when they use. And remove is going to remove the element. Uh, we're going to take the key as the argument and find is going to find the element and take the key as the argument as well. So uh, let's go ahead and do perfect hash functions. What does this mean? Well, basically, perfect hash function uh, links elements injectively, individually onto a table. This means no collisions are present here. Basically, it means injective means that we only have one to one. So that means we only have one here, one there, one there, but we have no two arrows uh, pointing to the same one, right? So for example, over here, uh, this would be not injective because we have two we have a collision, so to speak. So hence, this is why it's called uh, not perfect, but a perfect hash function um, links elements uh, individually onto a table and there are no collisions, right? As you can see, no collision, perfect hash function, collision present, two keys to same element. So in this case, it's important to note this out, right? Um, something to understand here is that this is mostly theoretical. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to find an actual uh, perfect hashing function from my experience, uh, I have not done that whatsoever, but we can read here. Um, if you guys want to be more in understanding of this, you can read this this whole thing. Um, oh, this is not. This is actually. Oopsie, this is actually not from there. This is. Let me just delete this. This is not from there. Sorry, guys. Yeah, just understand that there's perfect hash functions. They're really difficult to find, almost impossible to find, and I'll show you why later on. So how do we fix collisions, right? Via the usage of chaining that we already saw, which is this guy over here, which is a linked list. It says, which means using an implementation based on hashing and simple linked lists. Here again, our example, using this implementation would result on the class methods to have the following complexities. When we insert, we have O of one. When we have, when we remove, it's O of n. And when we find it's O of n. It's pretty much as that. Normally speaking, the average, the average of these, you know, the average, it's O of one, but the worst case scenario is O of n. Oops. Average O of one, average O of one. But most of the time for all these three, um, is going to be O of n in worst case scenarios, right? So let's continue on. And now we're going to understand why we cannot really find a perfect hash function, right? Um, here it is, the birthday paradox. Uh, honestly, I'm going to leave a, a really quick uh, link to a Vsauce video explaining the birthday paradox. It's really interesting and it's really, really important in our situation to understand why this is not possible. But let's just give a little, little, really quick overview of how this works. If we have four kids in the room, the probability of them to share a birthday is 1.63%, so pretty low. However, as the number of people you know, grows, we have a higher chance for them to share a birthday. For example, for 23 people, we have a 50% chance. Why? Take 10 people, for example. So in this case, we're only comparing one person with all the other persons, right? Like, like that. Like so, and like so, right? We're only comparing this here. And the more comparisons we make, it's self-understandable that the, the number will grow. Why? Because we're not searching for two persons, so for a person in your group that has the same birthday as you, rather two people that have the same birthday. It can be any birthday, but as long as it's the same birthday, that's enough, that's the actual probability we, we want to find. So we can actually see this from ChatGPT. Again, if you want to understand this a bit more um, in depth, 
watch a Vsauce video, Vsauce. I'll link it under the description below. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and look into this. For a smaller group like 10 people, the probability is lower than 50%, but it's still interestingly high when you consider how many days there are in a year. Let's calculate the probability, probability for a group of 10 people. The first person can handle any birthday, right? So the probability that no one shares a birthday is one. That's pretty self-understandable. But the second person must have the birthday from the different first person. So the probability is 364 divided by this. And the third, and it goes on and on, right? To find the overall probability that none of the 10 people share a birthday, you multiply these probabilities together. So you do the first person, second person, third person, fourth person. Once you compute this, you get a probability that represents the chance that no pairs of people share a birthday among the 10. So basically, we're trying to find uh, the chance that no pairs of people are sharing a birthday. This is basically no shared birthdays. Once we get the probability of that, we can subtract it from 1. So here, right, is going to be 1 minus no shared birthday. So what we're calculating is basically the no shared birthdays thing. So running this computation, you'll find the probability is around 0 0.1169 or 11.69% for a group of 10 people. I think I copied it wrong. More, I think ChatGPT is wrong with this number of the 10 people, but you can still check it out in the internet. So this type of paradox is analogous in how we will virtually always get collisions, no matter the hash function. However, we can find functions better suited for less collisions, right? These are called universal hash functions. So we already talked about the perfect hash functions, which is like that there's no collisions there, right? Like they're perfect, hence they're perfect, right? But these are kind of like non-existent, if we're honest, right? However, we can go and check this universal hash function. And the universal hash function, um, it has the main objective to minimize the probability of collisions. There are collisions involved, but they try to minimize them as much as possible. So if you want to understand them a bit more, um, you know, deeper, we can see a family of H of hash functions is said to be universal. If for any distinct keys A and B, the number of hash functions H and H, for which H A and H B is at most H over M, where M is a number of slots in the hash table, kind of like, you have to really understand this. It's a bit confusing, but honestly, we can skip it. But it's like kind of nice to know the theory. In other words, for any two distinct key keys, the probability of a collision may under a randomly chosen hash function from H is at most 1 over m, m being this number of slots in the hash table. So a really classic example would be here, the universal hash function of, for integer, in, integer keys. Honestly, we don't care about this. It's not really necessary, but it's just to understand what a universal ha hash function is. So now we can see the last thing, which is hash table with linear probing. So I really show you how to avoid collisions, right? How to fix collisions. We can use chaining, but we can also, we can also use linear probing. So what does this mean? The idea, right, is to add elements. And when a collision is found, we go to the next free slot. If we reach end, start from beginning. So this method is really easy to implement. It's space efficient and cache efficient. But it's important to note that this is not as good as we have um, less space for elements, unlike the chaining method. So what I mean with this is, for example, imagine we have following hash uh, hash table. Let me just remove this. Imagine we have different indexes here. One, two, three, four. And imagine we let me just remove this. This is not important. And imagine we just want to um, add the element, I don't know, two, right? And we add it in the first, um, no, let's just, a, a better example. Let's say we have a key, right? And the key is going to be basically the hash function of it is going to be the, basically this, right? So in this case, uh, yeah, I don't know. Imagine we have this is a key and this will return us the index, right? This is our hash function. Hash uh, function. 
and there's the return to index, right? So in this case, we're gonna take the key, and let's say that we take the key as, uh, I don't know, one modulo of 10 is gonna be one. So we're gonna store it here, right? But then let's say one modulo of uh, 11 modulo of 10 is also gonna be one, right? Um, before we keep doing this example, I'm gonna just doing something dumb here. Let's do 13, I'm sorry. You'll understand what I mean in just a second. So 10 is gonna be three. And then it's going to be 14, 10 is going to be 4, and then 11 modulo of, of this is going to be, oops, of 10 is going to be 1, right? So what I mean with this is, okay, we first add uh, basically our little 1 here. We're going to add it here, obviously. Then 13 and 10 is going to be, well, basically 3. So we're going to write here 13, right? And then 4 is going to be 14, obviously, as we already st stated here. But then we have 11 and 10. So as you can see, when you do 11 and 10, it wants to go to index 1. Normally, with the chaining method, we would just make a little block here, and we will just write here 11, right? In this case, we're not doing that. Rather, we're going to find the next free slot. So in this case, it's going to be 1. Oh, so it goes 11. It's as easy as that. However, Imagine we have, I don't know, imagine we have other values here, like 12 or something, I don't know. And we want to add the value of, uh, I don't know, imagine 21. So 21 modulo of 10, this will give you 1, right? So in this case, we would have to skip this one, this one, and this one, and then we were going to write 21 over here. That's basically how the linear probing works, right? And this is going to be the first... Uh, method we're going to be implementing C++. So yeah, I think this is pretty much it for this video. Uh, again, uh, thanks for watching. This is mostly the theory we're going to be focusing on, and uh, we're going to be looking into how to actually implement this in C++ in the next video. So see you then.